This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, Pat, thanks for this wonderful uh, introduction. And, and I, of, of course, want to thank SIPS for that, that great opportunity. It's for me an honor to be here. I didn't expect so many people that there's still a queue, so uh, either the food is good or there's something interesting in the talk. <laughs> um, I do want to highlight that I made seven versions of this presentation, um, down from should I show very specific scientific results, because I'm in Cornell, kind of the, one of the, the most important universities, to should I go broader and show everything we do. So as uh, I took finally the decision, and you may like it or not, but that's, that's the decision, version eight would be for next time, uh, to go broad, to basically, as this is a six year endeavor, I think, um, I took the decision to show you everything we work on so that you can connect and see where are there potential collaborations. That means I will not go very in deep in any of the topics because it would not give me the time. And it also means that there are others standing behind each of the slides. So every slide is not me on my own. Every slide represents people within CIMIT that do the work, but that are willing to collaborate with each of you and are willing to set up um, collaborations. That also means that in the future, I can go and give some more in-depth presentations and seminars uh, on specific topics. So you can ask Johannes for the next, next time that I come around to give those more particular uh, topics. I also want to say that the work here is done because I'm standing on the, on the shoulder, shoulder, shoulders of, of giants. I don't know if Ken is already here. If not, he will, he will probably arrive, I guess. He's lost probably somewhere. We will, we will find him. <laughs> um, but Ken Sayre was, was uh, my, my PhD uh, supervisor and mentor, and he happens to be here at the same time. So I'm, I'm very grateful for uh, uh, following those examples. Also, of course, Ronnie, for, for everything you have contributed, and many more here. When I first, uh, other disclaimer, when I talk about CIMIT, International Mason Wheat Improvement Center, yes, Macy's corn, for those of you that doubt about that. Um, the, the, when I talk about CIMIT, I don't talk only about the institution. I talk about CIMIT and, the, and that includes the network of institutions around that. So I tried to put a couple of logos of those who contributed to this, uh, presentation of all those partners that have contributed. I made a second one and then I stopped. <laughs> so just so you are aware that this is not a presentation of CIMIT as an institution, this is a presentation of the result of a whole network of institutions. Also, I want to remind so several of you that the US should be very, very proud um, of this collaboration and I want to especially highlight it in the times where we are. I had the honor to discuss with uh, Secretary of Agriculture Purdue a couple of weeks ago and to receive your Vice Secretary of Agriculture, um, Ted McKinney, and they both used this phrase, and I liked it, the most successful bilateral effort between US and Mexico. So they saw CIMIT as that, and especially because, of course, of this guy who's Norman Borlaug, who is the only man that I still know that has saved one billion lives from famine by applying science to agriculture. And of course, you know everything about that. And if you don't, be aware you have the best source here sitting front row, which is Ronnie Coffin, which is the, still the first and only PhD student of Borlaug in that time. So I am not going to explain what Borlaug did because you have a way better source than I am. I do think what he also did was not only saving one billion lives, he set up an institution with a, which is CIMID. CIMIT has offices in 13 different countries, projects in 40 different, more than 40 different countries, which are the green ones on the map, and we work with over 300 partners. But the impact goes beyond the countries where we have projects, and to not, in order to not only pick on the US, Australia, for example, 95% of all the wheat grown in Australia comes from the network of research that is done in uh, Obregon, that is done in Elbatan in Mexico through uh, the wheat research uh, network. So today, I think we have to be aware that there's three conversing challenges. Climate change, population growth, and limited natural resources. 
we are already using 1.5 Earth in order to feed the population. If that population is going to grow, that is projected that we, if we don't change, we will be using 2.5 Earth by 2050. And we can debate, I'm not going to go into it, but yes, climate change is going to affect what we are doing and how we are doing it. So we probably have to do, produce more with less and especially do it better. Number one, this is a similar crisis as the one Borlaug had the capacity to listen to. This is an invitation that we all listen to carefully to the, today's crisis. And Borlaug formulated a response. Today we need to formulate a response, which has to be equally transformational, but it's not going to be the same response as Borlaug developed. I know I'm talking about more, and this may be a little bit misleading. I think this is what we have been driving at during the past centuries. Doing more, more efficient, faster, but we didn't really look at resilience. And I became aware of that after discussions with Lloyds of London. And we asked Lloyds of London, do you realize what the impact is of a food crisis? Is that in your models of insurance? And they said no, because we have no idea how food crises work. So we came together with a group and we developed scenarios in which we basically took five events that happened the past 20 years and we said what would happen if you put them at the same time in the same year. Can we develop a scenario that uh, paints that? Just to be clear, a scenario does not predict the future. It is very difficult to predict, especially the future. So don't try to do that. It gives you an option, it gives you a scenario, it gives you a thinking frame to see what may happen. So we worked through this scenario, we talked to the, the hotshots at Lloyd's, and we said, look, what would happen if we put those five events together, which is basically a UG99 uh, impact, if that, would, if that kind of an event would repeat, if we would have El Nino, which means droughts on one end of the world and floods at the other end, uh, and if we increase temperature, what would actually uh, be the result of that. So we did all our fancy scenario work and huge workshops, multiple stakeholders, and we came up with this. It would mean 7% of global production loss for wheat, 10 for corn or maize, 11 for soybean, and 7 for rice. So many asked us, whoa, 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 but your scenario was only about wheat. That's obviously if wheat prices go up, farmers decide to substitute other crops. So you get impact on those other crops. So we only look through it of the lens of wheat. Went to Lloyd's and Lloyd said, thank you very much. Nice work. We don't care. So we went back and we said, can we translate this in economic value? Can we translate this in price hikes? So this would mean four times price increases for those commodities uh, and five times for rice. Went back to Lloyd. Lloyd said, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the work. We don't care. So we calculated further down. We said this would lead to humanitarian crisis, food riots, and a drop in the US stock market of 5% and in the EU stock market of 10%. Lloyd said, I hope you enjoyed. We are very interested. <laughs> Obviously, because insurance is sitting here. Obviously, because this is very, very important, but also, we learned from that that we could use it actually as a leverage because that means now that food security or food shock also is very important for business continuity. <coughs> Electricity was already one of the factors insurance would look like for a business, would look at for business continuity. Grain, grain production for a Kellogg's and Nestle was not something that was on that map. It was equally important as post-its and paper clips. That changed with this and I will get back to that later on. I do want to highlight that unsustainable global food systems are the compelling force and source for migration. So if we want to do something about migration, we have to develop working agri-food systems in Central America, in North Africa. That is why if we want to respond to today's crisis, it's going to be an integrated agri-food system approach, which yes, looks at food security, but especially at nutrition. But at the same time, it has to guarantee that agri-food system, that it has a certain circular operation so that we can safeguard nature conservation. 
I don't believe in the opposition between conservation and agriculture. If we look at it as a landscape system, those two need to be integrated. And last but not least, and actually I put it first, human security, human and national security. So I'm convinced that resources for agriculture research, for agriculture interventions should not only come from USDA, should not only come from USAID, they should come from the military, they should come from the health sector, because if we calculate the billions of dollars that go lost in insurance, in uh, health care, that we could prevent through working agri-food systems giving the right nutrition, it's a huge amount of money and a huge return on investment. So you are smart students here. Somebody needs to do those calculations. Somebody has to put this picture together and show it's not enough to just say we know, we need to show it to those decision makers of those investments. So for that, we need to integrate public and private sector, small, medium, and large scale farmers. Let's stop with the discussion if it's large scale, medium, small, it's the integration and the resilience you build through diversity and research development and markets connect them. In order so we can build an enabling environment, transforming the sector into a sector of change, innovate, invest in alliances, and support at the same time the individual. So yes, we need applied science, but in real time in far with farmers. We also need innovation and technologies, but we need to put them together in innovation systems and make sure the public policy is an enabling environment. So this was CIMIT with improved varieties today our response has to include multiple other aspects does that mean simit has to stop breeding no does that mean simit has to stop building pillars of excellence in sustainable intensification no we require those pillars of excellence but we also have to put them together in an integrated fashion so we can respond to a systemic to a systemic response so to take the journey Simit safeguards the biodiversity of maize and wheat, a task that also many, many thousands of farmers do in their fields. And that field uh, in, situ, in situ conservation is complemented by a big gene bank with 150,000 seed samples of wheat and 28,000 samples of maize. Why I'm just showing this, I have had the honor to lead a big investment done by the Mexican government, which is called Masagro. It's around $20 million a year, depending on depending on the circumstances. Um, and one big step was to characterize the gene bank and Cornell has uh, participated in that. And the first MACE Atlas was uh, announced in COP13 in Cancun. And we're today working on the uh, wheat uh, atlas and many, several departments here have supported with data science and with analytics and with, in order to have the critical mass to do this. This gene bank, is this important for the US? Yes, it is. This is a map of what the seeds or the, the samples or how you want to be entries that are sent throughout the US to multiple institutions yearly. So from this seed bank, packages are sent to multiple institutions in this country. In the same project that we do in Mexico with Masagro, we did the next step and we said, if you have the breeding part and you develop new seeds, new maize seeds, and you don't have a vibrant seed sector, it is not going to work. So we set up a pre-competitive space where seed companies are working together, sharing data, integrating the data. We started with 40 seed companies. Today we have 70 smallholders, small seed companies. Many of them are actually farmers coming together and taking the next step towards the business. When the project started in 2010, 75% uh, of the market was uh, in hands of uh, what back then was Pioneer, Monsanto, and the other big ones. The rest was in smallholder companies. Today, 35% of the market is served by this group of companies with a focus on center and south of the country. While do I highlight that? This is big agri bigger agriculture. This is smallholder agriculture. So those big companies are still focusing here. They're still making the same money. The pie hasn't become smaller money-wise. The pie has grown by serving this area here, which was unserved. 
And the concept was to bring those companies together, not to compete, but pre-competitively share data, integrate them, give them methodology, and they do compete, obviously, in the market. And you can see that this is, uh, this is the number of new hybrids introduced by the seed companies and their portfolio of products for the large companies, for the medium and the small large, this is the large Mexican company, so that's still very small compared to the, to the big uh, multinationals. And you can see uh, that from uh, Masagro started in 2010, so you can see 2008, this was the status quo, um, actually very, very low in the small ones. Then in the mid 2012 to 2008 to 2012, it takes time before you ramp up, still very low. But then since 2013, three years after the project started, data were exchanged, trials were out there, this is what happened. And this makes it easier for farmers to access those products. Obviously also the Mexico government invested in wheat. And so there was a, they were the first investors in the wheat yield consortium. Um, and obviously there's the whole wheat yield network with multiple other donors that uh, release new high yielding uh, wheat lines, obviously collaborate with the uh, Rust Initiative and uh, just one number for every dollar invested in wheat research worldwide, $100 is the return on investment. <coughs> so not bad. Bad news is if you're gonna put $100 here, you're not gonna see it back, no? It goes to farmers, it goes to, so it's a social return. Is this important for the US? Why am I putting those slides here? Because that were the questions your Secretary of Agriculture was asking me all the time. Every slide was, but yes, but is this important for the US? Yes, sir, it is. 40% of all breeders varieties come from Simit. 60 per, worldwide, 60% of all US wheat varieties are derived from Simit. And that is obviously a contribution <coughs> also to well-being of wheat farmers in this part of the world. This is not enough. If we want to transit, transit agriculture from a threatening sector that threatens well-being and nature, and a sector that is being threatened by climate change, changing pat, uh, 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 climate patterns, to a responsible sector where we apply what the crop requires and where we have resilient systems to, uh, to weather, we need to also not only change the seeds, but we need also to change the practices and the whole system around it. So that means you have a couple of principles that we are looking at. Can we diversify crops? Can we reduce soil movement? Can we look at soil surface cover, which would be conservation, conservation agriculture, but you have to put all the other appropriate elements on top of that. Probably you have to rethink the whole system, but I will get there. So I'm taking you to a thinking pattern, what we had to go through. So we looked at long-term trials. Simit had, uh, has still very successful long-term trials, very well managed. So if some students wants to come and do what I did, I saw the trial. The only, Ken was only measuring yield. So I decided to measure soil, uh, soil health. And I, had a, I had a fantastic uh, MSc thesis and a very good, after, why it wasn't of me, it was because this was just a gold mine, right? If nobody measured 20 years of different practices, whatever you measure looks good. Even if, it, if nothing comes out, it looks good. So this is, if you want to have a good thesis, just call me. Um, <laughs> these are the yield results of those trials. So you can see conservation agriculture green on the top. What farmers are doing is blue. And then uh, if you do think all everything wrong, which means monoculture, zero tillage, and you don't leave any residue, you end up in the red. For me, this was already quite a huge message. Be careful when you talk to farmers and we, when you send out one delivery messages. If I would go out and say, do zero tillage, and the traditional practice of the farmer is actually monoculture, conventional tillage, and taking away the residue, and I would only stress the tillage part, I would drive him to the red. I have to stress you have to also leave residue and do crop rotation. So if the farmer forgets that one element, it can be pretty tricky. This is for maize. For wheat, for corn, maize. Uh, for wheat, you can see the differences are similar, but they are uh, less uh, drastic at the beginning. As everybody knows, wheat is a more noble crop than maize. Um, but after time, they also uh, start separating. Now, that was actually very frustrating when uh, 
I arrived at that point, that was around when I finalized the PhD, came as a postdoc, and I remember Ken saying, yes, but we have those long-term trials, but it's not going to the farmer. And it was actually Borlo coming to Obregon and said, I mean, last trip in his wheelchair, grabbed my arm and said, you have to take it to the farmer. Kind of thing. You gave a wonderful presentation in front of the long-term trial, but, and he didn't use nice words all the time. So he's something like, I don't give a crap, but this, you should take it to the farmer. <laughs> I, if you can edit that out of the tape, that would be great. Um, so that means that we need to set up a system where this basic research can be entered so that the knowledge can be taken up. That was our first idea. We quickly changed that and said, no, actually, we need a system where this knowledge can be used and we get questions back so that we can fuel our research relevantly. We can get new ideas from farmers. We can incorporate those new practices. So the system we developed was say, can we develop research platforms throughout the country with local universities, with the local research centers, but with a similar protocol that are connected to on-farm on -farm modules where we can compare practices that are connected to areas where farmers just implement, but we can still learn from it. And then use scaling so you have impact areas where multiple people adopt. So I forgot I actually made a Zoom, so I repeat quickly. It's a research platform, modules where you do side by side, farmers implement the technology, and then things should go off. <clears throat> and this setup obviously means you need to set up for a specific agroecological zone. But connect to different agroecological zones, so they're still learning also there. So I'm going to give you the example of Mexico, but we have examples in Africa. We want to have examples. We have examples in South Asia. Uh, CISA, uh, I think you, some of you may know Andy McDonald. He has been instrumental in putting that project there. So there's similar efforts going on that we can look at. And on the top, you need, that's not enough. This is infrastructure. On the top, we need a learning network that connects institutions, farmers, extension service, governments, buyers, that we can all put it together, but can we also map it and can we also use it was the big question. So step number one, the research platforms. Today, every point or every dot or how do you call it, every square, every triangle on this map is such a research platform. So we have over 50 of those platforms that look at the particular situation in the particular agroecology, but does do use very stringent <coughs> science-driven methodologies. This is farmers come and visit, farmers give ideas, but the minute it's, it's scientists managed, scientists uh, operated with input from the farmers. So this is a controlled environment. But it can look as controlled as this. Yeah? I mean, it's nicely like, laid out, but it is, it is in a safeguarded area, but that doesn't mean there's huge infrastructure around. And what were the results? Conservation agriculture in Yucatan, which is the south of Mexico, conventional agriculture. Conservation agriculture, conventional agriculture in Chiapas. Another one in Chiapas, but in uh, irrigated areas. Another one in San Luis Potosí, other way around. Here, water management is not about getting a lot of water in. It is making sure that you don't get too much. Soledad, Saciano, Gran, um, Soledad de Graciano Sanchez, conventional conservation agriculture. So this is just a couple of pictures to show what is coming out. Obviously, be careful. Am I seeing here, it always looks like that. Conservation agriculture is always better. No. I chose a couple of pictures of what is happening in those platforms so you can see that there is shared knowledge with a specificity. Yeah. Obviously, lead yield is not enough. We also need to look at costs, cost structure, and obviously profit. So you can see here, if you use some of the conservation agriculture practices, you can have, uh, get higher profit, higher benefit cost ratios, and you can go on there if you don't do, do other practices. So you have to go also to the economic return. Economic return is not easy and it, uh, it behaves very different as yield. And you can see this in this map. This is like the dots of uh, those multiple platforms and it's very difficult to get a pattern out of this. 
what is mapped here, this is production costs and grain yield. So there is not an easy cutoff point to get out here. So it's gonna be specific for each. Obviously you want to have the highest yield with the lowest cost, no? You would like to want to be, one of these dots seems very nice. So you have to go back and understand what happened here. One of these dots here, run, but, but at least now you know where you can go and look and see what, what is this cost driver? What has happened? Why is this not working? And it is not one practice. It is a practice, a decision in a context that is defining this dot. The other obviously is production cost and net profit, somewhat related, but not 100%. So while doing this, the breeders from CIMIT came back and got very worried because they were you promoting CA, but nobody planned CA. So is there gonna come more conservation agriculture? Is there gonna come a point on which you're gonna come back to me and say all your varieties don't work because now the world does conservation agriculture. So I said, well, okay, relax. Let's look at it first before we panic. So the questions were, does CIMIT provide appropriate varieties? Would conservation agriculture benefit certain varieties developed under conservation agriculture practices? And is there a negative effect if breeders all of a sudden would do everything on their conservation agriculture? I think they would also save costs their breeding would maybe also be more amicable with the environment. So step number one, we took 27 wheat varieties, 13 durum, 13 bread wheat, put them six cycles under conservation agriculture, fully irrigated uh, and, and drought, Co conventional irrigated and drought. Those lines were released over time. So we had some weeds from between the 60s and the 70s all the way up, up to 2000 a little bit before 2010, that's release dates, when they were released to farmers in that area. So what you can see here for bread wheat, good news for the breeders, yes, there is progress. Independent of the system, progress has been. <coughs> you do see that conservation agriculture, uh, you do see obviously that fully irrigated is lying higher, those two here, than reduced irrigation, no surprise. And you can see some slight differences that conservation act is lying a little bit higher than the conventional, but not huge differences. A little bit more differences for Durham. If you look at that, there's a whole paper about it. We can go in details. Uh, I'm sorry that I cannot zoom in more for those who are interested. When we showed that, the breeder said, yes, but all those wheat varieties have been developed under conventional practices. Would there be a difference if I would do all my breeding process on their conservation agriculture practices. So we talked with Karim Amar, and uh, he started, this was a huge project, we did parallel selection. Part under conventional, I mean, conventional CA started with the same input and see where this would be driving us. Huge work to end up with those two graphs. Again, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going over it too fast, but if you look at it and you know a little bit what is here, doesn't look very, I mean, a lot of work and not, the, not too much is coming out. I mean, it, there, is, there was not a big separation of those two breeding, of the result of those two breeding processes. This is the, what, what did came out was there's no negative effect of selecting under a given tillage system. <clears throat> Selector under zero tillage did slightly improve early vigor, but it didn't translate in yield. So, Good, bad, I don't know. Discussion for where's the, maybe that's how, if you look at early vigor as an important point for some good best practices in some of what you are looking at, maybe this is important. If you reduce uh, seed rate. And yield of lines from both selection stream was higher in zero tillage testing environment. So you could go to breeding under zero tillage, keep some money be better for the soil. That, that's what this research would suggest in Obregon, okay? Maybe in other areas, this is different. I just can tell you this is huge <coughs> research to do because keeping the selection separate, testing them out, thousands of plots. So it was a bit frustrating to, to not get really something out, but that's how, that's how research works. The other side of the coin for some people sitting here, what happens with soil quality? So soil carbon after 19 years, 
We do see zero till where you keep the residue has a higher soil carbon content, especially in the zero to 20 centimeter zone. So this is given these long-term values. So whomever wants to look at carbon cycling, microbial, whatever, there's a huge playing garden here. No? We said, can, this is a very, I know these are rough data, but uh, can we average the 20 research platforms and can we look what happens with CA, conventional pillage in all those different environments? And we did see under, convention, under conservation agriculture, zero to five centimeter carbon content did increase, uh, five to 30 centimeter, it increased, but less. There is more deep data down there. Next step, only mace and wheat is not gonna do it. Can we diversify? So we can optimize wheat management. So I see some wheat people here, and there are people that get all excited about wheat. So there is some research that we are starting to do. Can we do conservation agriculture? Is this only herbicide driven? No. We don't use GM. Let's be very clear. This is not Roundup. All those systems, I should have probably said that before. All those systems are not Roundup ready, maize or whatever, no genetically modified uh, crops. So some research on how to diversify for wheat management. Do cover crops have a role to play to this? When we looked in Mexico, all cover crop seed was more than 40 years old. No new research on that. So can we revigorate research on that for certain purposes that we didn't know it could have had in the past? That was not enough. If you do that, how do we get farmers to adopt if they don't have the right implement? And you're talking about smallholder farmers. We cannot give them the big John Deere's. But the tractor is bigger than their plot. So we started an effort with looking at the right machinery, all open access, so any blacksmith can get this kind of a building plan so that they can replicate it. More interestingly, we gave them iPads because people are visual. We learned out, we found out. Not many people know how to read these. So we learned from the Pokemon hype and we basically have now an app where you click, you, you put it on top of the machine, and the, how the machine should look like pops up in 3D, what is it called? I don't know the right name, like the virtual whatever, like a Pokemon pops up, but it's a machine, right? So you can, you can move it around. So for, for the blacksmith, that's a visual comparison instead of this is very complicated. Because this is a, it's a, 2D drawing of a 3D reality. And you, I'm very comfortable with that, but that's not how reality looks like. It's a representation of reality and we can do better today than that. And then we learned from uh, some of the efforts also from an ex-alumni here of uh, Cornell, the whole, uh, what is it called? Hello Tractor, Uber for Tractor, service to farmers. Is there something we can do with that? When we started the project, I was uh, very happy that the donor allowed me to put in a line that said, and this activity is activity number Z, everything you need to do to make the project successful. And we put the budget to that. So the last activity in the whole setup was, and anything you have to do to make the project successful. Luckily, we did that because we hadn't thought about post-harvest. Imagine that. So we had thought of a lot of things and not about post-harvest. Smallholder farmers lose 40% of the harvested maize grain post-harvest. So today we work on those post-harvest technology. And if I say we work, that means that every dot on this map is a farm-driven experiment. Over 2,000 of those experiments, side-by-side -side comparison of cover crops, conservation ag, post-harvest, over 10,000 extension areas. This means farmers applying those technologies and us harvesting the data and over a million hectares of, uh, of those in innovations implemented by 500,000 smallholder farmers. Obviously, citizen science became very important. Farmers are sending data to a very big database and we are using those data to send recommendations back to the farmer, but also to the Mexican statistical office where we are showing if they're making or not progress to the sustainable development goals. So we use those same databases downstream, but also upstream. Multilateral communication and communication networks are extremely important. I know you guys have some network experts in your different teams, so I think there's something here to look at. This is just one 
of those networks. We have those for each community, for each state. And obviously we know who this is. What does this mean? If you want to get the message out, talk to this entity person. Because the same effort to talk to this one is not going to yield the same success. Now, this is also pretty dangerous for two reasons. If you put the wrong information and this guy believes it, it goes out very fast. If you put the wrong information here, not that dangerous. That's why you need quality control mechanisms like the platforms, like the whole setup. So wrong information does not go out. And I on purpose don't, don't call it different. You can also imagine second danger at some point. Some very smart guy came to me and said, can I have this map for the state of Wakak? He said, yeah, what do you want to do with it? I mean the team of the campaign of the governor. <laughs> ah, he was smart. <laughs> we didn't give him the data or the names of ours. So you need an open space, but also a safe space for some of those data. Cornell can play that role, Simit can play that role, but we have to think about it. This whole system that we put it together from a lens, it's too complicated for me. This is social sciences that put together a lens of knowledge management. What does this mean for new knowledge management uh, concepts? So you can see types of knowledge, processes of knowledge. It's defined in time, space, and in actors. A whole publication about that. I, it's very complex, but it, I just want to show this, that there's a whole life laboratory of 500,000 farmers in Mexico, we want to do the same in Africa. You have such a laboratory already running in South Asia. Think about it. Think what you can, we can do with all that. Obviously, what was the impact? This is a simple graph, but Masagro started in 2010. This is the average yield at level of Mexico for a rain-fed maize. And uh, we are very happy that we could curve, change the curve uh, after this. Uh, and especially that the dots are closer together. I mean, this is not 100% scientific. You probably have to do another impact study, but at least if this already looked bad, I would already feel bad. And I'm not saying this 100% attribution to Simit. By essence, if you set it up as an innovation network, attribution gets diluted. I mean, no, this is not 100% Simit. So don't come and ask me, can I do an impact study? Can I attribute it to Simit? No, you can't because it is a network. So attribute it to the network. That was not enough. We didn't talk about who was gonna buy the grain. Nah, extra grain, it will disappear somewhere automatically. No? Yes, in some areas, yes, because farmers would eat the grain, additional grain for self-consumption, but that doesn't take you out of poverty. So next question was, can we put together markets that actually respond to that? So we started some, this is a, this is a slide from the World Economic Forum. So some models, can we aggregate farmers? Can we connect them to markets? We did that with smallholder farmers. So if you go to, you take the bus uh, Friday and you go to Cosmos in, in New York City, that they, they serve blue tortillas that are bought from smallholder farmers of this farmer network because they want to tell a story. Now you're not gonna save 5 million smallholder farmers by Cosmos restaurant, no? I, it is nice, it is good, it is important, but it's not gonna change the system. It's safe, but... So we asked ourselves, can we talk to Kellogg's, Nestle, Bimbo, Gruma, and others? So we went to talk to them and I said, I do not want to talk to your corporate social responsibility person. Nice guy, but I will drink coffee with him. I do not want to talk to your sustainability uh, person unless that person comes together with whomever is at the core of purchasing the grain. Because I want to talk business continuity. I want to show you the Lloyd's report to see what we can do. Because those companies were bringing in a ship, and I apologize to Iowa far uh, farmers, they were bringing in a ship of grain from Iowa, which was easy for them, two clicks on the computer. What we wanted to ask them is, can you actually, the extra grain that you will require for selling more, can we start sourcing it from smallholder farmers? That's an extra cost for the company. It's not that easy. Their purchasing system is not set up. So what was the extra value we were gonna give? So what we did is we set up a system with indicators 
where we showed that actually the company can on the one hand diversify the supply, so that generates resilience, and on the other hand, five more minutes and I'm finished, and on the other hand, it can uh, tell a story to the farmer, to the clients or to the consumers, but it also helps us with adoption. Why? This is the kind of graphs we send to the farmers now. This was a farmer sustainability evaluation. Green is good, yellow is bad, uh, somewhat bad, and red is very bad. Before he was connected to this market. This is a year later, his sustainability evaluation, because he can see it and he gets a value for it. Because the, the, the purchase, the, the guy that buys the grain said, yes, but I will only buy it if it's sustainably produced. So we use the same data to respond also to the companies, but also to send farmers recommendations. How can you move through scenarios, not to one point, change this or do that. Scenarios, how do these colors change if you take decisions to make it ready for market? All our projects today have online dashboards. So any investor, donor can go online and can see how many farmers trained, how many women, yield increase, that are automatically automated dashboards from those uh, data sources. So we asked, what is the next step? And the elections were going to come, and we thought this is the right moment to put forward what is the future of maize in Mexico. We asked three questions. Where are we? Where are we heading if we don't do anything? And can we do it better? So on the where we are, Mexico needs 36.5 million tons and it produces 24.7. If you don't do anything by 2030, it will acquire 46 tons and only produce 28. And we asked the multiple stakeholders, 150 different people, are you happy with this outcome? If they would have said yes, that's the end of the story, right? Nothing more to do. People said, we are not happy. Can we, the, well, because we don't want the demand to increase with 26 and the production only with 15, and we don't want to have a deficit of 17.7 million tons. We already have one of 12. So the, we did an, an exercise, multi-stakeholder. We dis designed transformational scenarios. We put the scenarios forward, and we designed for self-sufficiency, for drivers of change, and for milpa biodiversity and well-being. So it's kind of the more self-consumption of maize, safeguarding biodiversity, some other drivers, because that is not the same group of farmers. There's a book about it in which we describe the objective, short, medium, and long-term actions, expected results by 2024. Uh, and under each of these, there are sub-action identified and validated. Same thing for Milpa Biodiversity and Wellbeing, and this was put on the table of the presidential candidates. When the president took office, the president of, Me of Colombia joined him in the discussion, and in a five-minute discussion, president of Mexico said, oh, those guys did something interesting with maize. Maybe you have to look at it. I only need one phrase. So we went back, and the president of Colombia said, oh, that looks interesting. Follow up with me, my secretary of agriculture. So we did. When you talk to presidents, just one sentence is required for, for action. Uh, so we took that one sentence. I went to secretary of agriculture, said, the president said, I need to sit down with you, and I need to do it. So we did. Maze for Colombia 2030 vision, same exercise. Where are we? Can we come to agreement with all the stakeholders where we are? Where are we heading if we don't do anything? Interesting research piece. You can make it as complicated as you want. Run models, climate change models, uh, predict for 2030. How complicated you want to do it depends on how much brain power you have available. Make scenarios for a better future. You can make artistic scenarios. So some of the art sciences could actually come in here. So same exercise, we did that. Uh, we connected it with the SDGs. And today we have been asked to replicate it for Kenya, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Ethiopia. And it gives a roadmap. Is Simit gonna operate all of this? No, of course not. There's gonna be elements yes, there's gonna be elements no, but it could be good for Cornell to look at this document if you want to do something in Mexico or in Colombia. So I told you the story from the biodiversity making better varieties, setting up the seed system, making sure that farmers can co-develop, develop climate resilient production systems, incorporating other crops so they can co-design with different sustainability technologies here. We need to make sure we can scale it up with the right extension service, with the right um, support to farmers. That will generate grain surplus. 
that needs to be connected to local, regional, and national markets. So we can reach the consumer, which can be a farmer, by the way, reach agro-industry and local markets. So I think Simit started here. Today we realized we need to do an integration of those pillars of excellence in integrated programs that respond to the sustainable development goals. I want to thank all the donors that have contributed to this one story. There's multiple other stories of those worldwide. Thank you. Um, I think it was very interesting to see on the slide for Colombia how improved um, the, the adoption um, of improved varieties is a big um, driver in that strategy. Um, however, what I think is always interesting when looking at seed adoption is like um, whom um, do the seeds serve? Um, and I think um, it's very interesting in breeding to see how farmers participate. And while we've seen some improvements in terms of like integrating farmers into research strategies, there seems to be a lacking sense when it comes to that in plant breeding. So what does Simit do in terms of integrating farmer strategies in their breeding programs? Yeah, um, good question. And, and it depends. I mean, we are working with farmer communities that do um, participatory breeding with maize. So that, that, that's kind of one, one activity. Uh, we are incorporating farmer vision preferences for, 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 for the kind of material they are looking for. Same with industry. Um, at the same time, and this may be a bit controversial, but I also think we, you need to be careful. Not everybody has to do everything. It's a bit like, I mean, I call it always, not, I didn't invent it, but there's the concept of T-shaped skills. You need disciplinary skills and you need integrative skills. And some people have a very short T, Good, a good strong leg, breeders, good, this, you want them to be disciplinary, methodological, repetitive, and a short integration. Others have a short, I don't know, I don't know how to do it with my hand, but a short, no, and a bigger integrative capacity. You need both, but don't ask somebody with a short roof to be all of a sudden integrative. Maybe that's not his or her skill. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have to involve farmers, but I think we need to involve them at the right point so nobody gets frustrated. That's, that's the message. Um, uh, earlier on, you mentioned um, getting uh, all the different companies on board uh, in a pre competitive way. Yep. I'm assuming that that took a lot of back and forth to get them on board. Absolutely. Can you kind of comment on how you got them encouraged to start sharing data and yeah. these things that is usually very simple? Yeah. We made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> uh, it was very complicated. It was showing by doing, and the most important thing was trust. One of the mistakes, for example, we made, we got them finally on board. We said, okay, why don't you test the material of your neighbor? We, we will blind it so you don't see which is what. Uh, you send the data all to Simit, and then Simit will, uh, and then the next sentence, and then Simit will analyze and will send the information back. Negotiation dropped. Everybody opted out. They said, no way. We don't want Simit to do the anal analytics. We have analytics capacity. My neighbor doesn't have the same capacity. That's my competitive advantage. Send me the data. So today at the same time, same date, same minute, everybody gets the data. And then what you do with that data is up again in the competitive space. But at least for me, that was a mistake to say, we will analyze and we send you the analyzed. No, no, no. That's where the negotiation again broke because that was already over the pre-competitive space. So those kind of learnings were very important. Very important also to always say what you're not going to talk about. So to start the conversation saying, what is what we agree, that we disagree, and we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to touch it. GMO is one of those topics. Not going to touch it. Because otherwise, it got lost in that kind of conversation. Yeah, but so working against you is a, a revolution in global shipping and, and uh, subsidies in the development in North America and other developed parts of the world. If you, you think those forces can be mitigate in some way or overcome? <clears throat> just, just to be clear, I'm not saying that self-sufficiency is the road to go. No? We put the scenarios out there. It was the president of Mexico who was elected by the majority that said, I want to go self-sufficiency. I'm not saying that is the right road. That's the choice that was made. I do think there is a balance there. It is not about shutting one down and bringing another one up. 
It's about finding the balance between those two, and especially look at the resilience of the system. So if you look at the transportation system, I'm scared. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then worldwide, you have all of these large cities on yep. the coast where you can float it in so much cheaper than you can buy it. From yep. The I think people don't recognize how many, you know, what forces there are yep. against local farms. Yep. Absolutely. And no, and one of the biggest forces is uh, shipping companies. I mean, the big shipping companies are the biggest force against because that's their lifeline, right? So I actually was afraid that some of the broker, big broker companies were the ones that were going to say, no, we want to keep bringing that grain to Mexico. Actually, they were not. They, they we had quite some conversations because they see other business models they can adopt, adopt in, this new, in this new system. But yes, there are forces against. But I do think it's clear. We need to be very clear to say it is not shutting one down and bringing one up. It is creating the resilience we require by balanced intervention. Thank you very much, Ron, and uh, thanks everyone for the live This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.